certainly a wealth of a show as we welcome in Gunnar Nelson. Hey guys, how's it going? It's good to be with you. Fantastic, uh, Gunnar. Well, I'll tell you what, we're looking forward to having you back in West Michigan. You were just here not too long ago, I think, up in the, the Manistee area, so you guys have been kind of traipsing all over Michigan here, haven't you? Yeah, we have. Well, Michigan, Michigan's always close to our hearts anyways. Our granddad won the Heisman at Michigan in 1940. Yes. All right. we, can't get, we can't get enough of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk to us about the show, a tribute to, of course, your dad, Ricky Nelson, just in general. What uh, what can the folks expect when they come out to, uh, to see this show on uh, Friday night? Okay, couple of things. It's, it's, first off, there's nothing else there like it because there was no artist like Ricky Nelson. Mm-hmm. We call him the sleeper cell of rock and roll. He's single-handedly responsible for smuggling rock and roll into mainstream American living rooms at a critical time in music history. And he was able to do that because he was on the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, 435 episodes running over 14 and a half years. It is still the longest running sitcom in television history. But uh, people grew up with, with their neighbor, uh, Little Rick and stuff, and when he turned 16 and started to sing and was absolutely awesome at it, and a whole new career was created. For, uh, there were, uh, there was, uh, gosh, 260 million singles. Wow. And, uh, and, and 40 million album sales. Uh, songs like Traveling Man, Hello Mary Lou, Poor Little Fool, Lonesome Town, I Got a Feeling, Bucket's Got a Hole in It, Teenage Idol, uh, Garden Party. It, it, what an amazing career. So the most difficult part of putting this whole thing together for my brother and myself was to pare it down to something that would fit into 90 minutes of music from all of those great songs. But we were able to do it and put together something that's best described as an a and biography episode meets a high-energy rock concert because of his being filmed on the Ozzy and Harriet show, we were able to incorporate all those great video clips from his performances, from interview footage from his friends like Paul McCartney uh, and such, and into a really seamless, uh, high-energy show that really kind of assaults all the senses in a really good way. Let's go back and, and talk about your, your dad. Of course, he came to we all came to, to know him from the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, your grandparents, and as you said, it just spanned a, a big part of his life. When did he actually, um, when did he actually start singing, uh, uh, Gunner? It was in 1957. There was an episode called Ricky the Drummer. Now, you know, Grandpa Ozzy, and to make this clear, this is Ozzy Nelson, not right. Ozzy Osbourne, the real chief dad. <laughs> um, uh, Grandpa Ozzy wrote, produced, edited, and directed all 435 episodes. Wow. Amazing. Okay. okay, it was truly amazing. And, and about seven years in, the joke around the house was, you know, be careful what you do around Ozzy, because he's going to write it into a show. Seven <laughs> years into this run, he's clearly short on material. So, you know, the story goes, that our dad was out on a date with the Hollywood high school hottie. Her name was Arlene. Mm-hmm. Arlene was a year ahead of him in class, and everybody wanted to go out with Arlene. And <laughs> She, you know, our dad was a big TV star at the time, but she was really hard to get. And finally, she agreed to go out on a date with him. He's up on on a Mulholland Drive in his convertible, uh, feeling like a big deal, and everything's going great with his date with Arlene until an Elvis Presley song comes on the radio. Mm. And she freaks out and starts swooning and forgets that Ricky Nelson, the TV star, is even sitting next to her. And he sees his date going down in flames, and he says the first thing that comes to mind, which is, I'm going to cut a record. And she laughed at him like it was the funniest thing she'd ever heard. <laughs> so he decided at that point if he was going to make one demo and just hand it to her and say, here, laugh now, he was going to do it. So he went down to a place called Wallach's Music City on Sunset and Vine in Hollywood. And at the time, you could go in and actually sing a popular song of the day and, and come out of there with a little acetate record. And he did. And he sang Fast Domino's I'm Walking and was playing it for himself, kind of grooving to it uh, in his room that night. And Ozzy heard it playing from down the hall. And he walked in and he said, hey, Rick, this is great. Who's this? And our dad, you know, of course, great. This is going to become television show property now. So, uh, you know, our dad just said, well, dad, it's me. He goes, wow, this is great. We've got to write it into a show. And they did. And Ricky the Drummer was the episode where, uh, I guess, one of the members of a band that was playing at the school dance got sick. And Rick sat in and he sang. I'm walking. Ozzy was smart enough to put singles in the stores. Wow. Uh, because at that point, the, the philosophy was if you show music on TV, free milk and a cow and all that stuff, the kids weren't going to buy it. He proved them wrong. It sold two million singles in the first week. Wow. And a whole new career was born. And I always like to say, people ask about Arlene. Yes, Arlene did come by the Nelson family house about two weeks later and say, Rick, why don't you call me anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Great inspiration. Trying to impress women. How yeah. many of us have done that? 
all of hey, us. Hey, look, any musician who tells you he started making music for any <laughs> other reason than to impress a girl is lying to you, fellas. Oh man, and and, and really, I got to think. You know, your dad and and your grandpa Ozzy. I mean, they were they had to be among the first to, uh, you know, really utilize this market of, of television and music to because uh, because your your dad sang just about from that point on. He was uh, about every week he was singing a song, wasn't he? Well, he was the first guy to utilize the power of television to market music. Yeah. Absolutely the first. Uh, it was uh, obviously something that's clearly standard now with American Idol and such like that. But, you know, um, Life magazine invented the phrase teenage idol to describe our father for a cover story they mm. were doing. Mm. Talked about Elvis Presley, obviously, you know, that was the that was kind of the, the, the start that way. But uh, obviously your dad came in and was influencing, uh, you know, he wanted to be an influence of the Beatles, a lot of great uh, artists in his own right. What was the relationship like between Elvis and your dad? I'm, I'm assuming they had a chance to meet a couple of times. They, they, yeah, they were good buddies. Now, Elvis was a few years older than our dad, started mm-hmm. a little little earlier. And, and our pop was pretty concerned because, as Paul McCartney says, you know, like even like uh, like the Beatles, you know, you start out like your favorite idol, and then as you grow and you develop, you turn you know turn into your own thing and find your own feet. And uh, and our dad did that as well. So he was a little concerned, even though Carl Perkins was really our dad's favorite. That was really his favorite guy. He liked Elvis and all his music and stuff, but Carl was really who he was trying to emulate. But um, he was concerned when he was to meet Elvis for the first time, which was going to go on at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. And I guess Elvis was throwing a big party, and our our dad was invited through a mutual friend. And he was concerned that Elvis was going to be upset uh, because, you know, our dad had copped, you know, obviously a couple of his moves and and his swagger, uh, like a lot of people did in the beginning. And anyways, he was sitting there apparently in Elvis's hotel room, and apparently he, 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 he caught eyes with Elvis, who was across the room entertaining people. Elvis... Just, just freaked out. Went, Ricky Nelson. Ricky Nelson is at my party. How's your mom and dad? I love your show. You know. Apparently, he actually grew up watching the show like everybody else. And and he said, I, I used to watch your show to watch you sing and James Burton play guitar. And much later, James Burton, the the first guitar hero and our dad's guitar player was actually the guitar player that Elvis used to put together his 69 special comeback band. Man, that is phenomenal. It, uh, and uh, your mom actually was a part of the Ozzy and Harriet uh, adventure as well. Wasn't she on the, the show in the later in the later years? She was. She, I think she did the last two years of the show. I mean, the show was uh, canceled in 19... 19- 66, I believe, um, replaced by Batman. We've got to make way for progress. <laughs> but, uh, oh, man. And we're talking to Gunnar Nelson. He and his brother will be appearing at the Van Single Fine Arts Center and Byron Center next Friday. want to make sure you get tickets as he's describing this uh, multifunctional show that will feature the 19 number one hits of their father, Ricky Nelson, as well as some other great hits just sounds like an amazing show and we're talking about your incredible family lineage from uh, of course the athletes with tom Harmon being your maternal grandfather and of course you have a famous uncle as well yeah my uncle mark's doing pretty well as gibbs on ncis yeah is he ever yeah, yeah so the, the the girls love gibbs they love him so yeah i mean it's it's cool my sister tracy's an actress she was on a tv series called the father dowling mystery yeah, absolutely for years and years, and years. Um, we got, uh, you mentioned my mom was on the last years of the show. She's a fine arts painter. Uh, her sister, Kelly, it was the Tic Tac lady, oh. uh, that 30 yeah. year commercial run. Uh, of course you mentioned grandpa Tom and, uh, he was married to Elise Knox, who was voted the most beautiful woman in the world in 1941. Man. And, uh, they also made uncle Mark and he married Pam Dauber and yes. that makes it Mark and Mindy. So it's perfect. <laughs> it does. And of course, you should feel guilty about one thing. You come from such a ridiculously attractive family on both sides <laughs> that it's really unfair to the rest of us that we're way back at the end of the line. Well, which prompts the question, what the heck happened to me and Matt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I think you have a lot of screaming young ladies that would uh, beg to differ. Now, <laughs> well, you know, that part of doing what I do certainly doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> and mentioning the family lineage, you're now in the Guinness Book of World Records after you and your brother hit number one with love and affection. That uh, set quite a record. Isn't that a crazy stat? A lot of mm-hmm. people are not aware of the fact that Grandpa Ozzy and Grandma Harriet actually met when, when Ozzy had a big band. He had a big band. and sure. They had a number one song in 1934 called And Then Some. And then our dad had Traveling Man and Poor Little Fool, 
and then we had love and affection. And and that's apparently a, a Guinness fact is that we're the only family in history with three generations of number one hit makers. Yeah, we mentioned the Beatles, and obviously your your father was a, a major influence on on they as well. Paul McCartney. I know you've worked with with Paul too. But was it was it a situation? I mean, your dad had his time in the fifties, and I talked with Bobby Vinton a few years ago, and he said, "Boy, when when the the four lads from Liverpool came over, the whole music industry changed, and it kind of washed away a lot of the the folks." Did your father at, at first get caught up in that whole wave of uh, the British invasion? Thing and, and all of a sudden it, it became a little bit rough for him to, to continue his music? Well, I think it was really tough for everybody, but doubly so for our father because because of the fact that the family stamp was so strong. I mean, mm-hmm. think about it. The, the Nelson family show, really honestly, I mean, it was inducted into the Smithsonian because it set the pace for the culture at the time so much. It was the, the archetypical uh, Eisenhower era show. It's an icon for that. So when you have the times changing and when you have singer-songwriters coming into vogue like the Beatles and Bob Dylan and changing the paradigm up, you know, granted all those, those early rock pioneers and the Sun Records guys found it impossible to, to get airplay like they used to. But Rick, you know, for better or worse, was also so, so strongly branded with the Ozzy and Harriet show that when Flower Power arrived, he was considered completely over and passe and uncool and unhip. But rather than go away, like a lot of critics would have preferred for him to do at the time, he reinvented himself and learned how to write songs and had pretty much had a career in, in reverse as far as music goes where he learned how to write second. And, and that's what he did. All of his friends were guys like Bob Dylan and, and Chris Christopherson and Paul McCartney and, and George Harrison, and they were always stopping by the house encouraging our dad to write. And it was during that period of time that he had the experience where he went to Madison Square Garden and everybody expected him to be black and white TV Ricky. And instead he showed up with his brand new cutting edge country rock band and got booed off the stage, wrote a song about it, which gave us the, the legacy, you can't please everyone, you gotta please yourself. It had to be surreal growing up. You know, you talk about the, the folks coming over to the you know, the house of Bob Dylan's, the, the, the McCartney's, and, and, you know, obviously your, your dad's on TV from, you know, being a, a young age. I mean, talk to us about what that, what that was like growing up in a household like that to Gunner. Well, hey, you know, Mama Cass Elliot was my freaking babysitter. Wow. So, you know, I, I, it just, you know, honestly, it was what it was because at the time, fellas, there were no rules. You know, yeah. rock and roll was young. People were finding, finding their way as they went. And just doing the best they could. So, I mean, it only hindsight is definitely twenty twenty, but it definitely gives you more volume when you're when you're analyzing the situation on everything. You know, honestly, Uncle George was just my neighbor with mm-hmm. the funny voice, and I had no idea he was George Harrison of the Beatles. You know, but he was he was just George, and he was over. And you know, I, it wasn't until I was eight or nine years old that I realized that not everybody's father was a rock star. Yeah, it was just. I mean, I hate using the expression, but. You know, it was all relative because it's all we knew. Sure. You know, from the time we were babies, we'd be around the house. Our dad would have an acoustic guitar in his hand. He was rehearsing the Stone Canyon da- band down in the pool house down the hall. Um, it, everything was just really creative, and that was always very, very much encouraged. And it was just kind of a, a matter of course going down and seeing any one of a number of luminaries who at that time were not as revered as they are now uh, playing at a local club or something like that. That's just what we did as a family. So I'm really grateful for, for having grown up in that kind of environment because I, I had great social proof. I knew that just from, from my examples that doing this, doing what I'm currently doing for a living now, was, was not a pipe dream. It was definitely possible, and, uh, and, and I, I really wouldn't take that back for anything. I can imagine. Not everybody has Chris Christofferson sitting at the dinner table (laughs) saying, Gunner, pass the mashed potatoes. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Crazy upbringing. Now, of course, you perform all of your dad's great hits during these performances, again, next Friday at the Van Single Fine Arts Center. But I know there's at least one song that you and your brother have written, not performed by your dad, that has special meaning. Tell us about Just Once More and the inspiration for that. Oh, thank you. Just Once More is a song that we have not really released officially, but it's something that we always play at the end of every one of these tunes. And it was written from the point of view of appreciating the people that you love in your life while you have the chance to do it. It was a result of a, of a challenge that my friend Victoria issued me. She's written some big hits. And she said, guys, if you had five minutes left on the planet and you could only sing one song, what would you want it to be about? And what my brother and I realize is we've had incredible blessings and incredible life so far and, and journey. 
there isn't a day, regardless that goes by, that we wouldn't get everything that we've ever gotten and everything that we'll ever get for just five more minutes of tangible time with our best friend, with our dad. And, you know, you just never know when it's going to be the last time that you, you see somebody that you love. And, you, and you that old expression, you never want to end the night angry. It's really true. And, and I'm reminded of that all the time. And I just wanted to write a song that w- was going to be a constant reminder for not only me, but hopefully for other people, that uh, life is sometimes fleeting, that, um, that a lot of times, um, you know, we plan and, and God laughs, and, and you just got to make sure that you tell the person that, that you're right that's really had your back all of these years that you love them. Make sure that, that uh, you don't take them for granted, and that's what that song is all about. How old uh, were you when your, your your father, of course, killed in that tragic uh, plane crash back, I believe, in '85, uh, going to a New Year's Eve gig or a New Year's Day gig? I think. Uh, uh, talk to us about that day. How you how you found out about it? What that uh, that certainly had to be uh, the darkest day of your life. Well, we were 18 years old. You know, we were 18 years old, and our dad was our best friend. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a, it was a really tough time. Um, it was it was New Year's Eve. And he was on the way to play a show in Dallas. And my brother and I were actually supposed to be on that plane. Our dad had wow. a DC-3 that he had bought from Jerry Lee Lewis. And it's an old World War II era plane, and it was uh, classic. It was beautiful. It used to draw crowds at airports by, you know, the, the whole pilot set and stuff. And we, had, we hadn't flown on that plane yet. And um, he was going to be playing in Gunnersville, Alabama at his friend's uh, – his fa- friend Pat Upton owned a club there. He used to be in the Inspiral Carpet. Hmm. And uh, – he, he played in the Stone Canyon Band for a while, and he wanted our dad to perform there at the club. And so the plan was, my brother and I were going to meet down there in Gunnersville, Alabama, hang out with the band, see that show, and fly to the New Year's show on uh, in Dallas. And, uh, you know, our dad I must have had a premonition. He called me uh, the day before we were supposed to leave to meet him in Alabama, and he said, you know, I've just been thinking about it, and, um, and I want you guys to fly commercial to Dallas and just meet me there. And we said, well, Pop, you know, we've told all our friends we're going to be hanging out with you, and we've passed up a lot of parties, and the whole po- point was to actually fly on the plane. And he said, oh, I'm pretty firm on it. I, I'm just, you know, I just want you to do that, you know. And we said, okay, well, how's this? We're just going to wait a couple of days, and we'll see you after New Year's, and we'll call our friends and tell them that we can go to the parties now. And so the uh, the accident happened as a result of many things. They say that uh, the whole conspiracy of, of events have to happen in a certain way. To make a long story short, it all came down to – a 50-cent washer was mm. put in a fuel line that fed the Janitrol heater in the back of the plane and kept the cabin warm, uh, as opposed to the 75-cent washer. Uh, wow. and it created a small leak in the belly of the wow. plane, and uh, the plane caught on fire. They actually landed the plane successfully, but at, at that point, the smoke had taken everyone. And, and it's important to know that it wasn't just our father. It was his fiance and the entire sure. band as well, who were yeah. all our buddies. Um, so, yeah, it was very, very difficult. And I think the most difficult part of it was that the press was really not cool yeah. and made up a bunch of stuff. They, they just, I mean, just pulled it out of the air. They said, oh, well, he was doing drugs on the plane and stuff. And, and of course, that was completely disproven, but it, you know, it came out in the NTSB report six months later, and that wound up as page 20 news as opposed to front page news when all the damage had been done. Wow. So, so you got to deal with the fact that you lost your father plus all the garbage that the, that the, the press kicked up. Well, aside from that, too, you know, fellas, I learned about it from listening to the radio. Oh, no. You know, you know I mean, normally, I mean, it was New Year's Eve, so I'm, I'm out hanging out with my friends and listening to the radio and stuff, and it comes on, you know, they played a couple of my dad's tunes, and it's like, oh, he sounds really, really good. Mm. And they said, well, yeah, that's an honor. Rick Nelson, who was killed in a plane crash with his oh, entire wow. band earlier today. That's you know, they always notify, You know, they always notify family first normally, but, you know, I, I don't have any resentment for it because I realized after the fact all these years later that that... that that generation of my family really felt like everyone's family. Sure. You know, it really did, and I, I appreciate that. And, and everybody that we meet at shows, it drives that home. This family was really, really important to America when it was rebuilding after World War II and, you know, was, was looking for some stability and, and was looking for a surrogate family, perhaps, for a lot of people that – that had really crappy home lives of their own or broken family or families that weren't working out or whatever, they could always rely on the Nelson family to be there for them once a week. And to me, I'm so proud of my grandparents, so proud of my my dad, so proud of everything that they sacrificed and the standards and ideals they held for themselves because they really truly believed that they needed to uphold a certain example um, you know, of love to give to everybody you know, who perhaps you know, didn't have it uh, in their own home lives. 
I, I got to think that that the audience to something like this too is really quite a cross section. I mean, obviously you're going to have the, uh, the 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 people that are getting up there a little bit now that, that actually remember your Us. father and were fan <laughs> and were fans yeah. of, of your dad. But also, I mean, you and your brother Matthew have a career going on yourselves, as you said. You've got a career separate of that, so you've got maybe three or four different uh, generations of fans involved in this. Do you find that like uh, literally every age at, at these things? Literally every age. I, I've had newborns at my shows, and last week a young lady of 102 wow. came to our show. So, yeah, we see all generations, and we welcome all generations, and that's what sets this part of this show apart as well, is that you can bring the person you love, your parent, your grandparent, your kids, and if you're old enough, your kids' kids, and everyone's going to get something out of it. And, and as we get set to wrap up here, we want to certainly do justice for for what you guys are doing now. You mentioned uh, you're in Nashville right now. You got uh, got a project you're working on uh, at this moment, Gunner. Well, we just released a new Nelson Rock record, and it, you can find it on Amazon or on iTunes. It's called Lightning Strikes Twice. Okay. It, Twenty years after the fact, I know it sounds weird, but this was actually commissioned to be the follow up of our five million selling debut record, After the Rain. 20 years after the fact. Wow. So if you're one of those 5 million people that like the love and affection after the rain more than ever, only time will tell, you will love this new record. Wow. It is a seamless transition from one to the next. It's unapologetically 80s, and we're really proud of the work. <laughs> we hope you check it out. Well, we are certainly uh, proud to be a part of the history of your family. You're right. You feel like our neighbors. We're happy for the success for you and your brother, Matthew. Continued success, safe travels, success, safe travels, success, safe travels.